Okay, we're going to pick up where we were uh, last time uh, in social psych. Uh, constructive memories. Um, while researchers tell us that long-term memory is more or less permanent, they rarely mention that it is faulty. And of course, sometimes we can uh, we can make it false. Uh, I told the story of my dad uh, in World War II. Um, a lot of individuals, and I was talking to uh, one, of, one of the students um, after class, and he was saying he was saying that his uncle does, did the same thing about Vietnam. He only talked about the monkeys. He only talked about the elephant that he saw in Vietnam rather than uh, all the horrors that he saw. Uh, a lot of us, uh, we do it that way. We, uh, that's one of the ways that we uh, control ourselves is by only remembering the good things and not remembering any of the bad. And this is known as rosy recollection. Uh, rosy recollection not only excludes the negative memories, but it also tends to make the mildly pleasant memories more pleasant than the individual actually experienced them. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's an adaptive um, uh, mechanism in our brains uh, that allows us to not feel as bad uh, when we are in a, uh, a, a negative situation. Uh, we, we, it forces us it allows us to forget all the bad things. Um, when Mindy remembered her trip to Hawaii and the long hours that she spent on the beach, she remembered her experience more like a picture postcard from the 1930s, uh, rather than the crowded, smelly, often overcast, cold experience that she actually had. And if you've ever been to Hawaii, then it's not always paradise. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's overcast and it's, it's, uh, it's in, in the 70s rather than in the 80s. Uh, so sometimes you don't uh, always have a good, ex uh, a, a good experience, even in Hawaii. Not only does rosy recollection occur, but the opposite occurs uh, as well. Uh, researchers looking at recollections of people's significant others found that if they were still together, they remembered the affair as love at first sight. Uh, I've been married to my current wife for 39 years. Um, and uh, actually, I, I'm fairly realistic about, uh, about uh, our meeting. Uh, she has a rosy recollection of, of our meeting. Uh, I insulted her the first time I met her. Um, but, uh, I, of course, I had been married twice before. So, uh, it, uh, I don't have the, uh, the, same, uh, the same ideas that she has about our first meeting. Uh, she, you know, hers, hers is more love at first sight. And mine is, um, I got used to her, <laughs> and, and then I fell in love with her. If the couple uh, was no longer together, they tended to remember their former amarata, a amarata, as uh, selfish and bad tempered through the whole relationship. Uh, if you've ever heard me talk about my first wife, not especially my second wife, but if you've ever heard me talk about my first wife, um, I don't really have anything nice to say about it, which is kind of strange because. Uh, we had two children. Uh, we were happy for, for a period of time, maybe not a long period of time, but we were happy for a while. But I don't ever talk about all the happy times. I only talk about uh, the bad times. Um, research by Diane Holmberg and John Holmes uh, discovered that married couples often suffer the same reconstruction. Uh, surveyed just after the wedding and two years later, the researchers discovered that happy marriages reported similar results two years later. So if they were happy at, uh, during the wedding and they were happy throughout uh, their first year, then they tended to remember uh, even two years later when things uh, uh, quiet down, things change a little bit, uh, they still remembered it as very positive. Uh, if the marriage soured, however, they reported the marriage had always been, uh, had always been sour, they had never been good, and they uh, uh, reported nothing but ha unhappiness Nothing but happiness. Actually, that shouldn't say unhappiness after the wedding, uh, unfortunately. That's the way she works. Uh, such poor recollection could lead to serious misperceptions. Uh, the worst individual's current uh, view of their partner, the worse their memories are, which only tends to confirm their negative attitudes. Current feelings tend to guide our recall. Uh, each generation condemns the present generation, not remembering the problems in their own generation. And of course, this is, is something that we see. Uh, I've lived through lots and lots of generations. Uh, we were complaining about, uh, uh, when I was in my 20s, we were complaining about the kids that were uh, teenagers at the time. Uh, as soon as those people became uh, older, of course, they started complaining about the teenagers. 
So if you ask somebody in their 20s or 30s about the kids today, they'll tell you about how horrible they are and how they didn't act anything like that. But the reality is, of course, uh, all teenagers uh, uh, have negatives and positives. Uh, so the reality is that, uh, that uh, we have this, this negative perception of things, um, mainly because it ain't, it ain't us. Uh, we remember ourselves as, as being quite intelligent and, and uh, changing the world, and here these individuals are doing none of that. Poor memory tends to uh, be fairly universal. Uh, when American smokers were surveyed to find out their smoking habits, at least a third of the 600 billion cigarettes smoked each year could not be accounted for. In other words, they couldn't remember how many cigarettes they smoked. Uh, if they had a pack uh, of cigarettes and they smoked 10 of them, uh, they would remember that they only uh, smoked uh, three or four. Uh, and it was really kind of interesting that, that a third of all their cigarettes disappeared. A survey of voters showed that uh, while 61% remembered voting, only actually 55% did. Uh, so that, uh, it, that shows you that people remember doing something that they didn't actually do. Uh, voting, of course, is, is a right. Uh, we should all vote in every election, uh, and maybe we feel guilty about not voting, uh, so we just forget it. Uh, we just think, think that we did vote. Uh, survey, okay. uh, people uh, report drinking and eating unhealthy foods far less often than they actually do. I can uh, report to you today that uh, I was in Gallup this afternoon, and uh, instead of stopping for a hamburger or a taco or, or a burrito or whatever, uh, I came home and I'm going to eat my supper at home. Uh, I'm going to eat my spaghetti. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not eating any fast foods. I'm not uh, drinking any uh, uh, pop. I'm going to be drinking my lemonade and eating my, lemonade or my uh, spaghetti tonight. So there you go. When trying to reconstruct our memories of uh, events, people often incorporate misinformation into their memories, sometimes on purpose and sometimes to protect themselves from unpleasant memories. And of course, we all do that, and I'm sure that I've done that uh, it, with some of my stories. I'm sure that some of my stories aren't nearly as... Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not as heroic in reality as my stories make me sound. Uh, so the reality is that, uh, that I change my recollections as well. The problem is I can't... I really don't, I can't give you an example of when I've done that uh, because uh, my memories are my memories and I, I really can't change it. It is easy for people to implant misinformation into, into their memories. Um, uh, you know, it happens all the time. This may be the situation in some child abuse cases is the fact that, the, uh, that there is misinformation. Maybe nothing like that happened. Uh, maybe something bad happened and people are forgetting it. Uh, the you know they if they ask uh, uh, if they ask the father if he abused his child physically abused or sexually abused his child he may not remember it at all because he may remember it completely differently uh, than the child does uh, the child remembers being hit uh, or the child uh, remembers being touched in, in an inappropriate place uh, but the father uh, or whoever it is uh, may may not remember that at all they just remember that they were punishing the child. Or maybe they don't even remember that night at all, uh, because uh, you know selective memory. We all have selective memory, but we can of course implant uh, misinformation in our memories if we uh, if uh, if it's too painful to remember. Uh, the misinformation effect is able to occur because of the the way that most people retrieve their memories. Uh, most memory uh, retrieval involves priming, so we have to think of something. We have to think of the right thing. So if I were trying to remember uh, what was happening the other day, I was trying to remember the word serendipity the other day, and I couldn't come up with the right cue. Uh, but as soon as class was over with, of course, that word popped up into my mind, uh, serendipity. Um, uh, many of the uh, psycho psychopharmacotic, some of the psychotropics that we use uh, to, uh, to, to work uh, you know, cure schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. A lot of these uh, drugs were discovered serendipitously. In other words, they were looking for something else and they discovered a drug that actually worked on depression or actually worked on uh, uh, schizophrenia. Um, one of the, the perfect examples is tricyclics. Uh, they were trying to find a cure for schizophrenia or something that affected schizophrenia and they discovered tricyclics 
uh, did work uh, in uh, changing the uh, uh, organizational pattern of, of somebody's mind, but their depression went away. And because of that, of course, they realized, wait a minute, we have a, 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 a drug that we can use for uh, uh, depression rather than schizophrenia. Uh, there's another one that they were looking for a drug for, I think it was monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, they were um, looking for a drug that, uh, to treat tuberculosis and instead they discovered something that uh, made the person's depression go away, as exciting as that is. Uh, priming involves being given a hint uh, either internally or externally uh, to trigger the memory process. Since memory rarely happens spontaneously, we have to use a trigger, we have to use a cue, we have to use, we have to prime the pump before we can get the memory out. And of course, if you've ever watched Jeopardy, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, they're priming the pump with the question, actually with the answer, and they have to come up with a question. Uh, as odd as that seems. The way that priming works to create a situation where misinformation is produced is when an incorrect priming mechanism is used to recall a memory. Uh, so, um, well, let's uh, take an example of somebody who felt like they, uh, it was love at first sight when they met their uh, significant other. Um, they may remember uh, the second date, or they may remember the third date, and that may, may be what they, uh, they're priming uh, their, their memory with. Uh, but the other individual, of course, potentially remembers when it actually happened. The first time I met you, you know, this is what happened. And you're thinking, well, yeah, didn't we go out and have a milkshake or something? No, that was the third date. So there, the one individual is using uh, the wrong priming mechanism. Uh, because the memory is tied to an incorrect cue, the memory is called uh, forth uh, for the wrong reason. Uh, uh, <laughs> knight in the context of chivalry is used to prime uh, Ku Klux Klan, knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, of course, we're thinking chivalry, so if you are actually a member of the Ku Klux Klan, one of the things that might potentially happen is that uh, you refer to yourself as a knight of the Ku Klux Klan. It makes you feel like you're a chivalrous, like you're back in the uh, Middle Ages. Uh, when knights were in flower and whatnot. Uh, Slick Willie is used to prime the president, uh, former president uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, of course, if you, if you think of Bill Clinton as Slick Willie, uh, you have a fair, fairly negative idea of his presidency, uh, but the reality was he was a very popular president with most people in the United States. Not the individuals that refer to him as Slick Willie, of course, but the individuals that look at his presidency uh, as to what he did. Terrorism is used to prime the war in Iraq. Um, uh, that is, uh, which is kind of interesting because we started, uh, we uh, went into Iraq uh, to overthrow Saddam Hussein um, and uh, they, they kept using the word terrorism when they were talking about the war in, war in Iraq. But the reality is, of course, the terrorism that they were talking about or the terrorism that people were thinking they were talking about was a terrorism uh, of 9-11. Uh, but of course, uh, the Iraqis had nothing to do with 9-11, nothing whatsoever. 9-11 uh, was uh, perpetrated by Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was headquartered. The individual that was in charge of Al-Qaeda was, uh, was uh, Osama bin Laden, and uh, Osama bin Laden is Saudi Arabia. Uh, most of the terrorists, almost all the terrorists, I think there were 15, and 12 were Saudi Arabia, and the other three were, one was Jordanian, and one was uh, Palestinian. Uh, or whatever. <clears throat> but none of them had anything to do with uh, uh, the war in Iraq, or, or Iraq for that matter. Yet we kept using the word uh, terrorism. Research by Eliz Elizabeth Loftus uh, has shown that just by suggesting a connection, we can implant misinformation in people's memories that, are, that uh, is difficult to expunge. Despite there being no evidence to, uh, of uh, connection between Al-Qaeda and Iraq, the fabricated intellig intelligence by the Bush administration in 2003 still holds quite a bit of sway with people trying to rationalize the continuation of the war. And of course, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan were the two longest wars that the uh, uh, United States has ever fought. Uh, uh, they both have gone on for years. Whether the war in Iraq is over with now, it's really kind of hard to say. Uh, one of the things that has, that has happened is that Al-Qaeda has been replaced by ISIS. And of course, uh, that was uh, part of the, uh, the uh, Trump uh, campaign, was what are we going to do about ISIS? And of course, the reality is we, we turn the war over to the Iraqis, 
and uh, they were not winning, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, an example of priming in 2003 during the lead up to the invasion of Iraq, Secretary of State Colin Powell uh, briefed the UN on weapons of mass destruction in I Iraq. Uh, people in favor of the invasion still use weapons of mass destruction uh, uh, as a rationale for the war, despite not finding any in Iraq after the invasion. And of course, um, <laughs> it's just a point of fact. Uh, if he could have found any weapons of mass destruction, he sh certainly would have paraded them out. But uh, all those years we were in Iraq, all those, uh, those areas that we controlled, and we found no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, no, no nuclear weapons, uh, we found no chemical weapons, we found no biological weapons. Um, one of the things uh, that most people forget is that uh, before the war they were talking about uh, a, long, uh, a long gun. A long gun is a, uh, is a howitzer uh, with a very, very long barrel. And because it has a long barrel, it can project a, um, a round uh, for uh, many more miles than most howitzers can. And of course, this was, uh, uh, they were, uh, the Iraqis at one point were trying to buy uh, steel uh, so that they could, they could create one of these long barrels. Uh, but of course, uh, we never found any. Uh, and uh, if they were trying to, to get one, they never did. We never found any over there. Uh, people will often react correctly despite not consciously choosing to react in that manner. Uh, schemas are mental templates used to make decisions. We all have schemas. We have a schema for uh, going to Wendy's. We have a schema for going to Pizza Hut. We have a schema for going to uh, the Cracker Barrel. Uh, Cracker Barrel, you get to sit down and, and wait for your uh, food. At uh, Pizza Hut, you better do, probably do the same thing. Uh, you don't want to just stand around and wait for your food uh, that you normally sit down and, and eat unless you've ordered uh, something to go. Uh, anyway, so we have all of these schemas as to what you're supposed to do. What are you supposed to do with a basketball game? Well, you play the first half and then, and then they take like you know, 15 or 20 minutes off uh, before they start playing again. So what do you do during those 15 or 20 minutes? Well, you're, you go outside and do whatever you do. Uh, but uh, you don't sit where you were sitting before. Uh, you don't stay sitting there because, well, you can go out and get concessions. Uh, you can go outside if you're a smoker. You can go out and smoke. Uh, you know, the, you have schemas for just about everything. Emotional reactions are going with your gut feelings, uh, and a lot of people do when they are making decisions. Uh, they would rather go with their gut feelings than to think about uh, and, and analyze uh, what's going on. They don't want to put that much effort into, uh, into the, their analysis. Uh, expertise is unconscious understanding that guides our, our answers. Uh, the more education you have, the more expertise you have potentially. Uh, one area where I have no ex expertise whatsoever is um, uh, fixing my car. I can't fix a car for, for anything. I, I can probably change the oil. I haven't changed my oil in, in a long time, but I could probably do that. Uh, once upon a time, I actually changed I actually changed the water pump on my, uh, on my car. Of course, of course, this was 30 or 40 years ago when I was in the service, and I had no money, uh, but I changed the, the water pump in my car. Uh, I screwed it up so badly that, uh, as it turned out, the water pump was connected to the uh, power steering fluid, and uh, I, <laughs> I made a hole in the power steering line, and I kept, it kept all running out. I, I guess I should have done. I guess I should have taken it to a mechanic. If I'd had money, I would have done that. Anyway, it didn't ruin the car, but it didn't drive as well after I fixed it, which doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. Uh, implicit knowledge, knowledge and understanding that uh, we are not aware of, of consciously. Uh, this is really kind of interesting because sometimes we will dream about things. Uh, sometimes we will dream about things that. Um, we should be thinking about during the day, but it's unconscious. It's something that we, we, don't, we don't think about. So uh, this, this implicit knowledge is, uh, you know, you're, you're walking down the street and, and you see something and you understand what's going on. Sometimes it feels like deja vu, this, this implicit knowledge. But potentially it's something that you saw before, your brain tried to uh, uh, solve the problem, but it tried to, to solve the problem unconsciously. You came up with a solution, 
And now when you come across this again, you're going, wait a minute, I, I haven't even really thought about this, but this is the answer. Uh, it's really kind of interesting, implicit knowledge. Uh, and sometimes we'll dream about these things, which is, is kind of interesting. They've done research looking at dreams, and that's one of the things that they have, uh, have determined. Blind sight is perception that is not recorded consciously. Uh, so sometimes we will uh, we'll see something, uh, something will happen, uh, and uh, it will affect uh, the way that we react to things. But we're, uh, we see it, but we don't, uh, we don't put it in our, in our long-term memory. Uh, potentially it goes into our brains anyway, and so this, all this information is there. Uh, maybe we try to forget it. And, and it's still there. We can't get rid of it. And this is known as blindsight. Prospagnosia is really kind of interesting. Uh, an individual who's suffering from brain damage, uh, they cannot recognize uh, faces. So if they see somebody and it's somebody that they should know, uh, they will not acknowledge who they are. They can't, they can't identify that person. However, their brains are, uh, are, are creating their heart, they're making their heart rates beat actually faster because they actually do recognize the face, but they can't articulate it. So their heart rate actually increases. So if they saw somebody, you know, their father, they have brain damage, they see their father, uh, they can't say, Dad, hello, Dad, I remember you, uh, but their heart will, will beat faster despite the fact that as far as they're concerned, as far as their conscience is concerned, they can't, uh, they don't recognize them at all. Intuition is recognizing someone you know in a younger face uh, of the individual, uh, which is always kind of interesting. Uh, I am going, <laughs> I'm going home. Uh, well, you know I'm going home. Uh, so I'm going to see all these people that I haven't seen in 50 years. Uh, last year I went to my 50th high school reunion, uh, and there were some people that didn't look anything like what they did when they were kids, when they were kids, when they were uh, graduated from high school. And other individuals, you could, you could recognize them right away. It's really kind of interesting. Uh, subliminal uh, is reacting to stimulus that is below your threshold of recognition. And of course, uh, subliminal messages are quite controversial. Uh, schemas are organized structures of knowledge built from experience containing uh, causal uh, relations uh, formed from a theory about how the social wor world operates. These are schemas, and we all have schemas for just about everything. I have a schema for teaching. Um, I have a, now I use PowerPoints. I used to just use notes, uh, but I'm telling the same stories I've always told, unfortunately. So, um, so a lot of you guys are hearing the same stories over and over and over again. But usually there's a point to my stories, even if I can't remember them. Uh, and of course, that is that's my schema. Uh, now I use PowerPoints. I like to put pictures in my PowerPoints. I think that uh, by putting pictures in my PowerPoints. Uh, even if you don't understand what I'm talking about, uh, even if you're not listening to what I'm saying, you can look at the picture, and sometimes the, a, a picture really is worth a thousand words. Uh, and, and I think that's really important, uh, especially as psychologists. We need, we need to be able to read things. Uh, sometimes we read things incorrectly, but we need to be able to read a situation. Uh, we need to be able to uh, determine if an individual is... Uh, is uh, able to, to, to hurt themselves. Uh, we need to, we need to uh, look at them. We, can, we should be able to look at their faces and determine if uh, they're in pain or, or not. Uh, and of course, uh, that's you know, one of the aspects of, of being a, a psychologist is the fact that you are trying, you are, you are reading uh, the people that you're dealing with. Uh, people with expertise on a topic have a well-developed schema about that topic and of course, that uh, uh, my mother used to uh, do cross crossword puzzles, um, and she had a schema for doing her crossword puzzles. Uh, she knew lots of, of different information that people normally didn't know. I mean, it was use useless in information. What did they call a serf in, in ancient, uh, uh, you know, in, in Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, England? You know, what 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 is the word for that? She knew that she knew that word because I don't know what that word is, but she did, uh, and she could do a crossword puzzle in uh, very very rapidly. Uh, the only problem she had was when they came out with popular movies like uh, uh, or popular books like The Hobbit or uh, The Fellowship of the Ring 
uh, Harry Potter. She didn't know anything about Harry Potter, and she didn't want to. She didn't want to read the books. She didn't want to learn about them. Uh, the only reason she would have read them is so that she could actually finish the crossword puzzle. Uh, so sometimes uh, she'd call me up on the telephone. Uh, here it is, you know, four or five o'clock in the afternoon, and she'd call me up on the telephone and ask me, you know, uh, what's Harry Potter's best friend's name? You know, Hermione, I don't know. Or maybe it's Ron. Usually it was Ron because Hermione's too long. Uh, people create scripts that uh, represent schemas about events, and of course we do that. Um, I have a uh, standard transmission vehicle. I have uh, two standard transmission vehicles. It's really kind of interesting. One is a uh, 2001 pickup truck, Chevy pickup truck, uh, and the other is a 2016 uh, Miata, Mazda Miata. Uh, the Miata is a six-speed and the uh, truck is a five-speed. Uh, in order to shift into reverse, they are in opposite places. Uh, the reverse on, in my Miata is you have to push down on the uh, gear shift and push up. So it's, in, it's, it's up here. Uh, in my Chevy, in the, in the truck, you have to push down on the gear shift and you have to pull it all the way down, all, all the way over and down. That's where the, the reverse is. Uh, I very rarely get them mixed up, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but uh, reverse is here. Uh, I had a Miata before. The, I had a 2000, 1999 Miata and the reverse, well, it was a five speed, and the reverse was over here. So luckily I, don't, I haven't you know, ruined my transmission yet. But it's, it could happen in the future. It's a schema. These are all scripts for uh, starting the car and, and putting it into reverse. Uh, my Miata is really light. It's really a light car. So it rolls very, very easily. So I have to put on the emergency brake. Uh, but, uh, no, I have to put on the emergency brake. Whoops, sorry. Uh, the, 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 okay. Uh, Gender schemas are cognitive structures for processing information according to maleness and femaleness. Uh, the use of gender schema reinforces social stereotypes about gender. Not everyone is gender schematic. And of course, as, we, uh, as time goes by, our gender schemas are changing. Uh, once upon a time in the United States, and it wasn't that long ago, uh, to, uh, to be homosexual was, was a negative thing. As a matter of fact, uh, it wasn't until the DSM-3 uh, that it wasn't a, mil uh, a mental illness. Uh, so those of us who were born in the 50s and the 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, we potentially may have a different idea about homosexuality than individuals who were born in 1990 or, two or 2000. And I think it's wonderful that uh, these things are changing. But they do need to change. Uh, we, need, we need to uh, stop looking at people in a negative manner. Uh, and that's part of uh, positive psychology, it's part of what I try to teach people, is the fact that you should never uh, reject somebody just for, for any vague reason such as um, uh, their, gender, their, their sexual orientation or their, their, their gender orientation. Uh, Facebook has gone to, I don't know, 57 different types of, uh, of sexual orientation. It's really fascinating to read through these. Some of them sound like they're the same. Uh, but there are a lot of individuals that don't identify with male and female. They, they identify themselves differently. And, you know, I, I think that's okay that you, you need to be able to identify uh, yourself as comfortably as you possibly can. And you should be comfortable with, uh, with, who, you think you, with who you feel like you are. Who you think you are, I guess. Uh, once a schema is activated, we see more information consistent with the schema. We process the information more quickly. We remember it better. Uh, a note, uh, schemas can be activated outside of our conscious awareness. And this is kind of a problem. This can be potentially a problem. Um, so one of the reasons we have schemas is so that we can process information very quickly. If a group of individuals came in this room and one of them was armed with a pistol, uh, one of the things that we need to determine is, is that um, uh, individual a danger to us? Uh, so we have schemas uh, for what is da what, uh, how uh, dangerous an individual is, uh, potentially. And so we need to, we need to be able to do that. Uh, unfortunately, some individuals um, maintain stereotypes that are relatively negative about, uh, about select minorities, uh, which is really kind of tragic if you think about it, because just because 
you know, a white guy comes walking in the room doesn't mean that he's you know, going to uh, do something negative. Uh, just, you know, and, and uh, if you ever watch Cops, it seems like uh, uh, all the bad guys are either African American or they're Hispanic. Uh, expanding, uh, Hispanic gentlemen with uh, shaved heads. It's really kind of interesting. Uh, but we ma do maintain these schemas. Uh, if, I, if I were walking down the street and I saw a Hispanic gentleman who had a shaved head or had uh, very, very short hair, I probably wouldn't think anything about it. But uh, there are individuals, of course, uh, because they watch cops or maybe they watch that show way too much, uh, they, they assume that this, this individual is, is dangerous. And, of course, that may not be true even a little bit. So one of the problems we have is, is that we act, some of these schemas are activated even though we're not thinking about it. Um, this is a picture of... Uh, <laughs> this is an advertisement for Crown Royal Whiskey. Uh, and uh, one of the, the interesting things about, uh, uh, about alcohol is that uh, if I, I, I don't drink, so when I look at this picture, I don't really see, I see a broken bottle of whiskey, and I don't really care, I can't smell the whiskey because I don't like the taste of it, I don't drink it, so it doesn't mean anything to me. But if I were an alcoholic and I looked at this picture, for one thing, I'd be upset that the, the bottle is broken. Uh, I would be, I, I, maybe I could taste whiskey, maybe I could see whiskey. Uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, when an individual is um, uh, an alcoholic, uh, and they, they try to stop, one of the things that happens to them is they go into the DTs. They start, having, they start hallucinating. They have, they have delusions. Uh, so they, uh, they, they have these uh, uh, really negative episodes. Um, you know, if, if you watch the cartoons, uh, you think, well, yeah, sure, I saw that on a Popeye cartoon. Uh, the drunk guy, when he uh, didn't, wasn't getting uh, alcohol, uh, he started seeing pink elephants walking around or whatever. Uh, but the reality is, of course, uh, they're a lot more horrific than that. Uh, they see monsters. Uh, they, feel, they feel bad. Uh, so if, uh, be, because I don't drug, buy alcohol at all, uh, you know, this, this isn't going to make me want to buy alcohol. But if I were an alcoholic and I have, had gone through the DTs, these are the guys that drink uh, that buy the most alcohol. These are the guys that uh, are, are keeping the uh, Crown Royal people in business. Uh, I might put some kind of a monster in this. And if you look at this, there are some really interesting uh, images in the uh, in the spilled uh, alcohol. Uh, this almost looks like a ghost. That's kind of a ghost. This kind of looks like the guy that's screaming. Uh, you know, the scream. That's, that's what that looks like right there. So potentially if I've had a wolf's heads are very popular uh, to be put in these things as well. Uh, in any kind of monster, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to activate their, their schema, we're trying to activate their memory of the DTs, uh, and that will make them want to go out and, and get, have a drink or get a drink from, from someplace. And as you can see, there are various images. Those of us who aren't alcoholics, we don't, we're not going to recognize this. But of course, if I were an alcoholic, then it, may, it might make me want to go out and drink some Crown Royal, at least not a broken bottle. Um, a lot of times what they'll do is they will put images in the ice cubes. And uh, if, you can, if you can see this, there's a strange image down here. There's something going on down here. There's a, a, almost an owl figure right there. Uh, anyway, tonic is, is something that you mix your drinks with. So, and, and once again, they're not really aiming it at me because I don't drink, but uh, if I were an alcoholic, potentially I, could, I would see these images uh, in the subliminal, potentially they're subliminal uh, images. I would see these images and want to go out and have a drink or get a drink or find a drink. Uh, sexuality is also used. Uh, this is really kind of a, an interesting picture. This is a Newport uh, commercial advertisement back when they put uh, tobacco uh, advertisements in magazines. And of course, uh, things were a little bit different. Uh, so there is a sexual theme to that, uh, that, uh, uh, that advertisement. Um, another sexual theme, smoke Newport and what happens next. I don't know. 
Uh, the overconfidence phenomenon, we're not going to talk about that anymore, the subliminal messages. Um, but uh, there's two things that we can, we can read in, uh, into subliminal messaging, uh, especially if it's, it has to do with alcohol. We're looking for monsters that, uh, that reflect on the individual's uh, DTs that they once had. And the other is, is sexual. Uh, the other has to do with sex. Um, you know, we put sexual images, uh, double entendres, uh, we put these things in these advertisements, and it want, makes you want to smoke Newports because then potentially you'll get to have sex with uh, a blonde-headed lady. I think they're both blonde-headed, aren't they? No, she's got she's a brunette. Anyway, and of course that was back in the 70s. They don't do this anymore because we don't have any more tobacco advertisements uh, in magazines. The overconfidence phenomenon is a tendency for people to overestimate uh, the accuracy of their beliefs. They tend to be more confident than correct. Uh, and of course, if you think that you're intelligent, uh, you think you can predict the future because you're so damn smart, uh, the reality uh, may be that it's, it has more to do with confidence than, than correctness. Uh, you're confident that this is what's going to happen. Uh, once upon a time in the United States, uh, we fought the war in Vietnam. Uh, the first president that fought, in, fought the war it was kind of John F. Kennedy, but then uh, he inherited what was going on in Vietnam. There wasn't a whole lot going on. This is in 1963. So Johnson inherited the war. Uh, Johnson only ran for president once. Um, he was president from 63 to 64. And in 64, he ran for re-election. Uh, one re-election, uh, he was running against Barry Goldwater. <clears throat> Uh, so what was going on in Vietnam was that there wasn't a whole lot going on in Vietnam. But he wanted, uh, they were afraid that uh, if they allowed the communists to get a foothold in Vietnam, then potentially what would happen uh, would, would be that the, the whole rest of the area would, would fall. Uh, Thailand would fall, uh, Malaysia would fall, Indonesia would fall. And all of a sudden, instead of having uh, this tiny country of, of uh, uh, Vietnam as communists, uh, we would have an entire region as communists. Uh, and of course, we, were, we didn't want that to happen. Uh, so we kind of made things up. It's really kind of interesting. Uh, we thought that we were winning the war. We have the strongest military in the world. Uh, why in the world can't we defeat the, this small group of uh, Viet Cong, you know, these, these uh, uh, guerrilla fighters, and uh, why can't we defeat this, arm, this North, uh, North Vietnamese army, which they weren't uh, armed very well, or theoretically they weren't armed very well. Eventually the Chinese uh, armed them and eventually the uh, Russians uh, armed them. And here we are, uh, we're being held off by uh, this uh, group of ragtag uh, military people. And you never knew who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. Uh, unfortunately, the Vietnam was, was kind of a mess, mainly because it really wasn't, wasn't as, as political a war as we thought it was. We wanted it to be a political war, us against the communists, but uh, if, you, if you were in Vietnam, if you were Vietnamese, uh, then it was pretty much a civil war between you and the, and the government. Well, the government was run by, initially it was run by uh, uh, Catholics. Uh, the French had been in there, uh, they had converted select numbers of individuals, the people that they liked, I guess. Uh, they, they converted them to Catholicism, uh, so it was kind of the Catholics versus the Buddhists kind of an interesting situation. Uh, so here we are, we're thinking it's a political war, we're fighting it as a political war, and if you uh, talk to the Vietnamese about it, they would say, well, uh, we, I didn't know anything about communism, I really didn't know anything about democracy, I just understood that uh, the guys that were in charge were not the same religion as me, and they treated me really badly. So it was pretty much a civil war. Uh, and, of course, uh, the, the biggest problem that uh, Johnson had was the fact that he recognized his army as the, as the strongest army in the world, and for that reason, we, he tended to be overconfident uh, rather than uh, do the right thing. Uh, one of the interesting things about Vietnam was that uh, here we are, we're wandering through the jungle uh, in uh, fatigues, and uh, yeah, they were just green fatigues, uh, and we had uh, white name tags and we had yellow uh, chevrons on our, on our sleeves, as you can see. This guy, he was uh, in combat, and here he is, he's got, he's got his yellow, his yellow uh, chevrons on his sleeve. 
identifying him as a sergeant. And of course, he had his patch on here oh, as well. He's airborne, I think. I think that's it. Oh, maybe it doesn't matter. Anyway. Adolf Hitler took, off, uh, took on the rest of the world because of his overconfidence in the might of the German soldier over all others. And in the beginning, of course, uh, right at the beginning of the war, the war started in 1939, uh, he invaded Poland and then he, he invaded France and he took over almost all of Europe. He never took over Spain or Portugal, uh, but he pretty much controlled everything else in Europe. Um, and he was right uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, and then, of course, he started fighting against the British. Uh, the British uh, built up their military. Uh, we came into the war in 1941, and uh, there was this, uh, this idea that the Germans were, were supermen, uh, that they were super soldiers, and that we couldn't defeat them. But, of course, obviously we did. Um, one way or the other, we defeated them. Uh, one of the problems that they had, uh, that the Germans had, uh, was the fact that they didn't have um, they had a lot of horses that they, they transported their uh, ammunition and whatnot. Uh, so they weren't as mechanized as we were. One of the interesting, well, we won't talk about how, how much better their tanks were than ours. Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990 because of his overconfidence in his friendship with the West and their desire to continue to receive cheap oil from his wells. Uh, he thought that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't tell him no. Uh, so he went ahead and invaded Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait and Iraq, of course, uh, they uh, draw oil from the same uh, source, from the same oil well, oil section. One of the, they 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 drill at diagonally so that they can get the, uh, to this oil. And of course, he didn't like that. Uh, he thought it was his uh, his oil bed. And of course, the Kuwaitis are you know sneaking their they're angling their, uh, their wells more and more. They had all these wells uh, along the border uh, where he was also uh, trying to draw off oil. Uh, he had uh, asked someone uh, in the State Department whether uh, we would, whether we would uh, retaliate if Kuwait was invaded. And uh, they said, well, no. And the reason they said no, of course, was so that uh, they could keep the oil coming. Uh, it, they weren't accurate, of course. Uh, he thought we were friends. We had been friends because the, uh, he faced off the Iranians uh, back in 1980. He faced off the Iranians. And they fought a war for 10 years uh, against the Iranians. And because you know, the Iranians had kicked us out in uh, 1970, what, 1977, 1978, uh, they were our enemies. Therefore, the enemy of our enemy is our friend. And that's the way he thought it was going to be. But as actually didn't turn out that way uh, because he invaded Kuwait, we got uh, upset, and of course Bush went in in 1993 uh, and uh, kicked him out of Kuwait. Uh, Serbian leader uh, Slobodan Milosevic uh, claimed that he was going to take over Kosovo and expel all those who weren't Serbian. That was the idea; he's going to kick them out. He was certain that the world would not stop him because the people he expelled were Muslims. Uh, and he thought that, uh, that uh, the Christians of the world, the Christian countries, all the, the, uh, the Western European countries, uh, wouldn't do anything about it because they were Muslims. And as far as he was concerned, uh, the Muslims were a second class or third class uh, uh, citizens. Uh, so one of the things that happened, of course, was that he invaded uh, Kosovo. He started exterminating the, uh, the Muslims rather than uh, doing anything else to him. It was a, a really ugly, ugly situation. Uh, he was uh, killing all the men, and he was housing the women in warehouses and uh, systematically raping them. Uh, well, if a Muslim, Muslim woman is, has intercourse with, it, with uh, somebody that isn't their husband, uh, they either commit suicide or they're stoned to death by their, by their community. Uh, of course, this was all systematic. The idea was that uh, they were supposed to taint these women uh, so that uh, they couldn't go back to their uh, Muslim communities. That was the idea. It was really an ugly, ugly process. Uh, it was a genocide on a really strange uh, level. American peacekeepers stopped the ethnic cleansing and uh, remain in Kosovo, Kosovo to this day. We still have soldiers in Kosovo uh, as peacekeepers and to keep the uh, Serbians out. Are the Serbians our enemies? Because we bombed them, uh, what year was it, 1990? 1998, 
Uh, we bombed them and we, we forced them to stop. Uh, they thought we wouldn't do anything, but uh, Bill Clinton was the president at the time. Uh, yeah, it was 1997, 1998. Uh, anyway, he, uh, we told him to stop, uh, that we weren't going to put up with that, and he did. Eventually he did. Uh, he was uh, charged with, uh, with war crimes, and he was convicted in The Hague. As interesting as that is. Uh, confirmation bias is the tendency for people to look for proof that their perceptions, uh, because of their overconfidence phenomenon perhaps, are true. And of course, this is what was going on in Iraq uh, when we were looking for weapons of mass destruction. We, we started the war on the basis that they had weapons of mass destruction, and if we didn't do something about the, uh, uh, about the Iraqis and their weapons, that they would hold us hostage at some point. That was the idea. But of course, we went in there and we found nothing. But, uh, okay. So the question is, uh, was the Bush administration a uh, lead up to the war in Iraq a case of confirmation bias? Were they looking for proof? I mean, they were seeing really interesting things and claiming that these were, where is it, I don't know. Uh, they, were, they were looking at, at, at uh, interesting buildings. I mean, they were saying, well, this is a chemical munitions bunker, uh, this is a decontamination vehicle, this is security, sanitized bunkers, UN vehicles. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they wouldn't let them drive uh, up to these uh, facilities, and they were claiming, well, look, that's obviously uh, a chemical uh, munitions bunker. Everybody, anybody looking at that can tell it's a, uh, chemical munitions bunker. Of course, once we got into to Iraq and we actually went to this building, we found nothing. Uh, so this was you know, a school bus. They were doing some kind of training in there. Had nothing to do with chemical munitions at all. So yeah, we can uh, talk ourselves into a lot of different things. And some of it is relatively, can be relatively negative. Heuristics are rule of thumb strategies that enables an individual to make quick, efficient uh, judgments about a situation. We use heuristics. We use them all the time. Uh, rules of thumb. Uh, anytime you're at the swimming pool, you need to wear a swimming. You need to wear a swimming attire. Proper swimming attire. Uh, that would be a heuristic. Uh, you can't jump in the pool with uh, your jeans on. Uh, that's that's a rule of thumb. So it's a heuristic. It's, it's something that we always do because that's the way it works. We use heuristics to promote our own survival. Humans as species have developed heuristics to ensure that uh, survival takes place. Being right isn't nearly as important, of course, as being alive. Uh, so we, we use these heuristics all the time. Uh, you know, the rule, uh, don't... Uh, don't jump on, don't try to walk in the subway because the third rail is electric and it will shock you to death. You know, it's a rule of thumb. It's a, it's a concept of survival. Uh, don't go near the guy playing with his pistol. Uh, once upon a time we were, <laughs> I was working in the emergency room, I was actually working in the lab, and they called me down because they had a gunshot, they had a gunshot wound. And uh, so I went down to draw blood for cross matches and whatnot. Uh, but I got there, and what had happened was this guy was playing quick draw. He was playing quick draw with his pistol. He had a, a .357 Magnum. It was just a really powerful gun. Uh, and he's drawing on these people. He's drunk, he's sitting in his chair, and he keeps quick drawing people as they walk past the door. And then finally somebody said, don't do that. You know, that gun may be loaded. He said, it's not loaded. Look at this. Put, stuck the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Probably not a good idea to be around somebody who's playing with, with, with real guns. You know, they're just and he was playing and he was drunk, so it was it was uh, pretty bad. He had, he died. He eventually died, uh, but he wasn't dead when he came in, and we had to try to do whatever we could do. There wasn't much we could do because most of his head was gone. Uh, one of the most common heuristics that we use is detecting uh, typicalness uh, when making a decision. Uh, this is known as representativeness heuristics. So we're looking for something that is typical. What does a typical white person look like? What, is, what do they act like? Are they greedy? Is, uh, is this something that's, uh, that they always do? Do they try to taint their faces orange and comb their hair across their bald spots? You know, is, is this a representative heuristic? 
Uh, representative heuristics are often applied even against overwhelming odds because we trust our instincts so frequently. So we try to, we, we assume that everybody like, uh, that uh, uh, is, is from this group, they're all alike. They're all exactly alike. And of course the reality is that uh, that really doesn't exist. But that's what we're looking at or looking for. Uh, this is a, uh, okay, this is really kind of interesting. Uh, this is, we're looking at representative miss uh, uh, heuristics. Uh, over the break, I read a book uh, about uh, Tversky and uh, Kahneman. Tversky and Kahneman were two Israeli uh, psychologists, uh, and they collaborated uh, on um, changing the way that we look at psychology. Uh, and one of the questions they asked, what, one of the things they did was create scenarios, and they would ask you, what is more likely? What is this guy? Uh, what is his job? Uh, let me get this is a good example. Uh, 70 engineers, and this is actually from the book. Uh, 70 engineers and 30 lawyers were interviewed, and here is a random sample from the interviews. He is a, he is a twice divorced man who spends most of his free time at a country club. He regrets following in his father's footsteps. He wishes he, he hadn't spent so much time in college. Uh, on academics and instead spent more time socializing so he wouldn't be so quick to argue with people. Is he a lawyer or is he an engineer? That's the question. Now if you said either engineer or lawyer, you're, of course you, you have a 50-50 chance. There you go. Yeah, you have a 50-50 chance of being correct. Whether he's a lawyer or an engineer. Does any of this information have anything to do with what he became? The reality is no, it has nothing to do with whether he's a lawyer or an engineer. That's reality. He has a 50-50 chance of being either one. So despite the fact that he looks, may look like a, a lawyer but because he likes to argue, um, you know, that, that really has nothing to do with anything. That's a representative heuristic, representativeness heuristic. 80% of the people that looked at, at uh, that heard this scenario said that he was a lawyer. But of course, if we look at statistics, if we look at probability, uh, it shouldn't be 80%. Uh, it should be a 50-50 shot. Linda's a 31-year-old, uh, single, outspoken, and very bright. Uh, she majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear nuclear demonstrations. Lovely Linda. So what is Lovely Linda? Is she uh, a bank teller or is she a feminist bank teller? I know, that's a question that you have to ask yourself. And the answer is, there's no way of knowing, uh, just from that, that little piece of information. We're making, we're making value judgments. We're, we're projecting what we think they are. Timorous Thomasina. Thomasina is very shy and withdrawn, invariably helpful, but with little interest in people or in the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul, she has a need for order and structure and a passion for de detail. Is she a librarian, a teacher, or is she a lawyer? And of course, because we understand the, the, the statistics, she could be, uh, she's got a 33% chance of being any of those, uh, any three of those. Just because of the uh, of, of what we read, it doesn't uh, really identify who she is. Well, while people tend to uh, be slow to uh, deduce particular instances from a general truth, they are remar remarkably quick to infer general truth from a vivid instance. This is known as availability heuristic. So if we're looking at a group of individuals, because those individuals are close and something happens, we assume that something uh, so one of those individuals is the individual that perpetrated whatever it was that happened. Availability heuristic. In the South, far more rapes are committed by white males than black males. But because the rape of white women by black males is so widely publicized, white women are more likely to fear a stranger who is black than one that is white. Even though the reality is more white males uh, attack uh, women in the South than black males. Uh, but they're deathly afraid of black males. Availability heuristic. This is the story that they've heard. Let me see if this works. Uh, this is the Willie Horton ad. 
No, it's not going to work. It's not going to connect it. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, once upon a time, um, uh, Mike Dukakis was running against George H.W. Bush uh, for President of the United States. And uh, George Bush uh, had a, an advertisement where this guy was in the advertisement, a guy by the name of Willie Horton. Uh, and he, what he was trying to say was that uh, Willie Horton was actually from Massachusetts and had been in jail in Massachusetts and he'd been released by Mike Dukakis when he was the governor of the state. So what George Bush was saying was that uh, danger, danger, Will Robinson, be very careful uh, if you elect Mike Dukakis as president of the United States, he's going to release uh, people from prison. And of course they may be dangerous. And unfortunately, um, the, he, he seemed to be playing the race card. He claims that he wasn't. Uh, he claims that uh, it, he, did not, he didn't have anything to do with the ad. But the reality was, and of course this played down south, uh, and it scared people uh, into voting for uh, George H.W. Bush rather than uh, Dukakis, Mike Dukakis, because they were afraid of black men, as odd as that seems. All right, where am I going now? There we go. Uh, unfortunately, as humans, we tend to base our heuristics on what, what is in our memory rather than take time to analyze the situation. We assume that if uh, something comes readily to mind, then uh, it is commonplace, and of course that's not always true. Just because it, it's, it, it readily comes to your, to, to your mind doesn't mean that it, it's true, doesn't mean that uh, it's, uh, it's accurate. Uh, if we looked at this, as we look at this picture, uh, this, is a, uh, this is actually um, at the uh, uh, FDR uh, Memorial in Washington, D.C. And of course, he was president during the uh, Great Depression. Uh, he was elected in '32, and the Depression ended uh, sometime in the late '30s. So this was something that they saw in the, in the 1930s uh, during his administration. Uh, they saw uh, feeding lines. They saw lines of, of men that, that couldn't find jobs. Uh, unemployment at that point was uh, in the 25 percent range. So there were a lot of people that didn't have any jobs. And if you didn't have any jobs, how in the world did you eat? Uh, unless you were a farmer, of course, then you were uh, in, in pretty bad shape. So, you know, if you look at this picture, you see uh, these guys are all statues, and these guys are all real people standing in a, uh, in a line to get food. Availability heuristics. Because pictures of plane crashes and war are more likely to make the paper, people see airplane travel as more dangerous than automobile travel. The reality, is, of course, is that automobile travel is 26 times more likely, uh, uh, you're 26 times more likely to die in a car crash than you are in an airplane crash. And of course, tomorrow I'm going to drive to Albuquerque, uh, and on Thursday I'm going to jump into an airplane uh, and uh, fly to Indianapolis. So should I be more afraid of the, the trip from uh, Saley to Albuquerque, or should I be more afraid of the trip uh, from uh, Albuquerque Airport to the Indianapolis airport? And the answer is, well, I should be, I should be wary of my, uh, my car trip to Albuquerque. I'll be, doing, I'll be driving mostly in the dark uh, because I have class until 4.20. So it should be really interesting. I, 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 I already understand and know these statistics, uh, but I'm not that afraid to drive, strangely enough. Uh, the roads do get kind of interesting at night. Um, a deer, I saw a herd of deer uh, right on the other side of, uh, this side of Crystal uh, this evening. I drove to Gallup uh, this evening and uh, I saw a, a herd of deer. Uh, they were right there on the side of the road. They weren't that close to the road yet, but as the night progressed, I imagine that they would wander closer and closer. And of course, over the holidays, uh, on New Year's Eve, I'm driving to my daughter's house and uh, I hit a deer in my wife's car and took out, took out the, the, the whole left front panel, unfortunately, in my wife's car. Uh, we hadn't driven her car in like two or three weeks because I had been home and we were driving my car. Uh, we were driving the uh, Mazda instead of her Honda. And we, drive, we drove it one time and, and uh, hit a deer. I hit a deer. 
I didn't see it. But the herd was, evidently the herd was on the other side of the, the uh, uh, road. And the, the, the uh, deer that I hit was the trailer. You know, you've always got a male trailer. You know, the second level male, you've got your, your alpha male is in front leading his does. And the, uh, the secondary uh, male is always uh, the last guy to cross the street. And that's exactly what happened. I didn't see him. I didn't see the herd. I didn't see him until he was right in my head. Counterfactual thinking refers to mentally stimulating events to imagine alternative scenarios. Uh, the closer an outcome, the more likely an individual will, will participate in counterfactual thinking. Uh, so if you come in second in a race, um, in, with counterfactual thinking, you go, you know, if I just tried a little bit harder. Uh, in 1967, I was, uh, I was on the mile relay team at my high school, and uh, we went to the regionals. Uh, and we, were, we were that fast. We went to the regionals. And uh, I was the anchor. I was the anchor man. Uh, I, I ran the last leg. And uh, as it turns out, we, when, when I took the baton, we were in seventh place uh, out of ten, ten teams. Uh, so I, I passed one guy right away, uh, thinking, you know, what the? But, you know, I'm a senior. Who cares uh, what happens next? So I passed this guy. You know, I could have burned myself out and then, you know, come across the line, dragging across the line. But that's not what happened. Uh, so I passed the guy right away. And then about the uh, 110 mark, I passed another guy, and then at the, what was it? Uh, right on the back stretch, I passed another guy, and then just before we came off the last turn, I passed the, uh, I passed the, the fourth guy. So here we were, we were in third place. And actually, the guy that was in second place was kind of struggling, and he's running way out here. You know, I'm, I'm running along the, the, uh, uh, the edge of the track, and he's running right in the middle of the track. And I'm running, running along, and I told myself, for some reason I told myself, I can't beat this guy. I don't know why I said that. The other guy was, was finishing, you know. But here we were kind of fighting for second place. And I wasn't that far behind him. I was only about five, maybe four or five yards behind him. But I still had a lot of juice. And I could have counterfactual thinking. Uh, the reality is maybe I didn't really have as much juice as I think I did. Uh, once, I, once we came across the line, here we are with this smallest school in the state, and we came in third in the regions, which was kind of amazing. One of the schools we were running against was the largest school in the state. That's the way Indiana does it, or used to do it. They don't do it that way anymore. Now they have classes, but back then uh, you ran against, uh, you know, everybody ran against everybody else, uh, which didn't give the little guy very much of a chance. Uh, but if you've ever watched the movie Hoosiers, of course, uh, that is about a team that actually did do very well. Okay, uh, It's actually about Milan, Indiana. Uh, Milan uh, won the state basketball championship in 1954, playing against some of the largest schools in the state. And, of course, they only had like 56 males in their high school. Uh, but they won the state championship, which was a bit of a surprise. Anyway, counterfactual thinking, that's exactly what I was just doing. I was, I was saying maybe I could have won that race. Uh, we came in third, um, and we broke the school record, and the school record still stands, and that's one of the reasons why I have to go to uh, Daleville um, on Thursday uh, to be inducted into the uh, Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, there, the more significant the event, the more likely the individual will participate in counterfactual thinking. Really kind of interesting uh, in that uh, we came in third. So we didn't win the race, but we still broke the record. Uh, the, uh, the, the week before, we had broken the record. Uh, we had fractured the record by like five seconds. Uh, and this time we broke it again by five seconds, uh, which is a lot of time if you're talking about a mile relay. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? Oh, we didn't win that race either. Uh, at the sectionals. We came in second, and that's why we got to go to the regionals. Uh, but we didn't win the regionals either. Actually, we didn't get to go to state. Uh, if I had come in second, if I had actually passed that guy, then yeah, we would have gone to state and probably come in 10th or something. There were only 10 schools. Maybe they, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. I, we never got that far. We were just a little bitty Dale bit. Uh, the more significant the event, the more likely the individual will participate in counterfactual thinking. And this was a big race. This is the last race of my high school career. 
uh, it was the sectionals. Uh, we were running against some of the largest, we were running against some of the largest high schools in the state. Really kind of curious. Uh, we were lined up, uh, you know, they, if, if you've ever seen a, a track meet, uh, the mile relay, they, uh, they line everybody up. There's 10 lanes, usually there's 10 lanes, and uh, they line everybody up. And you're seated, uh, we were seated seventh, if I remember correctly. Anyway, we're standing there, and we're standing there with all the other mile relay teams, and uh, and strangely, I was the tallest one on the team. I'm five foot six. I was five foot six then, uh, and I'm five foot six now. Uh, but we were standing there, and I'm the tallest guy on the team. I'm five foot six. Uh, we had all these guys that were six feet, six two, six three. You know, they're all standing around us. Uh, we're all lined up, and we almost got disqualified because they couldn't see us. They didn't know that we were we were there, and we were standing right there. And finally. I realized that they were yelling for us, and so I stepped out over the line and I waved at them, saying, "Yes, we, we are Daleville and we are here." Uh, but they almost they almost disqualified us because because they didn't think we were there. They couldn't see us from all the tall people, and everybody was a lot taller than we were. Here we were, a bunch of uh, little Aputians or maybe Munchkins or whatever you wanted to call us. We were not very tall individuals anyway. And, here we did as well as we did. Uh, there were a lot of people in the stands rooting for us because, you know, you always root for the underdog. But what's more of an underdog than, you know, the guy that's a foot shorter than uh, the uh, other man that's running? Uh, playing over and over again in, in our minds, the accidental death of someone close to us is very common. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the the things that happens to spouses, of course, uh, if they're if they're. Uh, spouse dies uh, accidentally, there is a Subaru commercial where the lady is talking about she married this guy, she met him when she was in the fifth grade, uh, they got married right out of college, uh, they had twin boys, and then one night a truck didn't stop and uh, ran into her Subaru. And of course Subaru has a high uh, accident rating uh, and uh, she says if it uh, hadn't been for Subaru we, this story would have ended right there. But uh, of course he lived. However, we tend to live with less regret over an incident that we did not, uh, we did the things that we didn't do. We don't usually think about things that we didn't do. We think about things that we did. Less regret over an incident that we did than things that we didn't do. Um, there is a famous quote, and I can't remember who, who said this, but he said, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And of course, if you've never, uh, if you've never been married, uh, or you've never had a girlfriend or a boyfriend, whichever the case may be, um, then potentially, <laughs> potentially you, you, do, you don't live with as much regret as if you did something. Okay. Trying and failing seems less regrettable than never trying at all. And of course, that's what that means. Do I have it here? Uh, that's Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, I hold it true, whatever will fall. I feel it when I sorrow most. Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Alfred Lord, Lord Tennyson, uh, in memoriam 27, 19, uh, 1850. He wrote that in 1850. Uh, life often occurs randomly. However, often people will put random events together. Uh, this is known as an illusory correlation, making a correlation where none actually exists. 93% of us think that we're above average drivers. And that's known as illusory thinking. Uh, the reality is, we, if everybody can't be above average drivers, the average has to be at 50%. So, but 93% people of uh, people think that they're above average. People must uh, create order whenever possible in order to control the random chaos of life. Sometimes the order that they create more represents illusory thinking than reality. Uh, so he, despite the fact that we're, we're trying to organize everything, the reality is that there's just chaos out there and we're, all of this control that we pretend that we have is, all, is, is, actually, is actually chaos and it's actually illusory thinking that we think that we can actually control things. Uh, skip old Bill, let's skip old Jocko. Uh, sometimes, due to illusory correlations, people begin perceiving that they have uh, the ability to control chance events. And this is known as the illusion of control. 
gamblers very often will think that they can control their luck. Um, they can control the cards. The reality is that our cards come randomly. You can't wish yourself to have the next card be uh, a spade or to be an ace or to be uh, you know a, a six that completes your uh, that completes your straight. There are you have 52 chances for that to be a six. No, you don't. You have less than that. You have uh, there's four. Four divided into what's four divided into 52? Uh, 13. If a 13, one in 13 chance of that being a six. <clears throat> Gambling is, is an example of illusion of control. Gamblers will bet differently uh, with nervous opponents than confident opponents. Uh, and so what they are looking for when they're gambling is they're looking for a tell. Uh, that when this person has a good hand, uh, they're, they're not nervous. Uh, when they are nervous, they're, they're uh, betting on a, on a relatively poor hand. And of course, this is one of the ways that gamblers can defeat people because they can actually read what's in their cards or how they feel about their cards uh, just by looking at Fortel. Uh, dice players will throw differently for high numbers than for low numbers. Uh, they will attribute near misses to flukes rather than the randomness of chance. And of course, this is all the illusion of control. Uh, when I played softball, I used to, to carry around a good luck piece. Uh, it was my hitting, uh, you know, sometimes I couldn't hit, and sometimes I could hit. So when I could hit, um, if whatever I was wearing that day, I would wear it the next day. This is my hitting shirt. Uh, it was a pretty ratty shirt too, uh, and it sometimes, it, usually it worked because I was playing slow bit softball. So uh, you usually can hit the ball one way or the other. You almost never strike out in slow pitch softball. Uh, but I, I wore a select shirt, and that shirt gave me it gave me confidence. I guess more than anything else. But the reality was it was the illusion of control. I was always looking for a good luck piece uh, that gave me the ability to, uh, to make all the catches and to always get a base hit. Another phenomenon of illusion of control is regression toward the average. Uh, when given a series of measured events, probability dictates that extreme measurements will be followed by measurements closer to the average. So despite the fact that you have all of these uh, uh, you know, um, uh, somebody hit three home runs in, in one game, and then the next game they hit two home runs. What's the probability they'll hit a home run in the next game? Well, uh, if you hit uh, 40 home runs a year, that means that you have a probability of hitting a home run in every 160 games. Uh, every fourth game you're going to hit a home run if you hit 40 home runs a year. Uh, so the probability is one in four that you'll e even hit a home run the next day. The pro but you've, you've actually reduced that probability because your average is 40 and you have, you, you've hit five home runs in two days. So what's the probability that you'll hit a home run? Well, actually it goes down because you hit all those home runs earlier. As odd as that sounds, that's, that's probability. Uh, However, people delude themselves uh, that they should be able to maintain high levels of results with concentrated effort, but the reality is uh, it will always uh, uh, wander off to the, the average. Um, we're going to talk about thought su suppression. We're, we're going to talk about not thinking about something. So what I want you to do is not think about a blue giraffe. Don't think about a blue giraffe. That's the last thing I want you to think about. Think about anything else, but not a blue giraffe. In order to control your thoughts, it requires monitoring for the unwanted thought, which requires the same part of your thoughts must be focused on the unwanted idea. So if I told you not to think of a blue giraffe, every time I mention blue giraffe, it makes you think about it. And now I told you not to think about it, so you, <laughs> now you have to not think about it. After suppression efforts in, thoughts rebound into consciousness. Are you thinking about the blue giraffe? Of course you're thinking about the blue giraffe because I've mentioned it over and over and over again, even though I told you not to. <laughs> so this is a problem. Those of you who are parents, uh, you're telling the child you can't, you can't play uh, video games tonight. I'm not going to let you play any video games tonight. Guess what? Every time you mention video games, it makes them want to play video games more and more and more. So you're, just, you're creating more of a problem by talking about it. 
Humans are emotional creatures who are uh, who all too often operate using feelings before and sometimes over reason. Research shows that unhappy people tend to be lethargic, socially withdrawn, even hostile. So they're depressed. They're unhappy. So what should what should they do? Well, they should try to be act the opposite of unhappy. They should try to act happy. But instead, they uh, are socially withdrawn. Uh, they're lethargic. Sometimes they're even hostile about it. They tend to be self-focused and brooding. Uh, any intense thinking that usually takes place is focused inward uh, for these select individuals. If given an opportunity to view happy and gloomy scenes, the unhappy person will linger longer on the gloomy pictures because that's the way they feel, despite the fact that they should be singing a happy song. They should be viewing the happy pictures, but they're brooding. They're unhappy. Therefore, they will spend more time with the negative images. Happy people are strikingly energetic, decisive, creative, and sociable. They tend to be more trusting, more loving, more responsive. Uh, they're able to tolerate more frustration. Uh, they are more forgiving and able to tolerate small criticisms. They tend to, to choose long-term rewards over immediate small pleasures. And that is a happy person. Emotions signal others our intents. Uh, so the probability is that humans evolved uh, trying to show other humans that there was something going on. If they were scared, they made a scared face. Uh, if they were happy, they made a happy face. They smiled. Uh, one of the uh, uh, universal emotions is, is smiling, is happiness. And the reason, one of the reasons that it's uh, evolutionarily positive, it shows uh, the individual that you're interacting with that you're not a danger to them. Smiling. Uh, some emotions are easily recognized across cultures, such as anger, surprise, and happiness. Darwin argued that the ability to, to decode emotional expressions aids our survival. So if, um, if we were walking in the, in the parking lot and somebody had a, a, a really horror-stricken, uh, was making a horror-stricken uh, facial expression, we would probably run over and ask them what was wrong. They are indicating to us, despite the fact they haven't said anything to us yet, that there's a problem and that we need to help them. Posture and motion convey social information. We often subtly mimic the movements of others. Uh, we don't know who, uh, we are doing it. Mimicry can increase our liking of some select individuals. Uh, if we can see this picture, and actually the light is a little bit too bright, uh, but if we can see this picture, uh, Barack Obama, these, both of these individuals are left-handed, uh, Barack Obama and John McCain. Uh, they ran, ran against each other in 2008 uh, for President of the United States. Uh, at one point, uh, the conservative right started attacking uh, Barack Obama for being black. And uh, John McCain told them to stop it. Don't do that anymore. I would rather lose this campaign than win it uh, by attacking somebody just because of their race. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this picture is we can see that these two individuals make a group. And the reason they make a group, let me turn off the light and see if it, if it helps. You can see the picture better. There you, go. you can see it a little bit better now. Uh, as you can see, they have their legs crossed. Uh, Barack Obama has his left leg crossed over his right, and John McCain has his right uh, crossed over his left. And that creates a group. That creates a circle. A a circle right here. This is Rahm Emanuel. Uh, uh, in, in the beginning, he was the uh, uh, office manager, whatever the hell it was. Anyway, uh, as you can see, he's kind of the odd man out because I don't think he has his leg cro legs crossed at all. But here, John McCain and, and Barack Obama are creating a group by because of the uh, uh, the way that they have their legs crossed, and they're excluding Rahm Emanuel from that group. As curious as that is. Okay, we're going to stop right here, uh, and we'll pick this up next time with Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> The, uh, he is actually the mayor of Chicago right now, so let me turn this thing off.